afternoon. Good afternoon, Rochelle. How are you today? I'm doing well, thank you. How about yourself? I'm, I'm okay. Um, thank you for agreeing to chat with me. I appreciate this very much. Um, so may I start by asking you to tell us your name and share anything you feel comfortable sharing? Sure. Yeah, my name is Helen Norris. Uh, I'm uh, the Chief Information Officer at Chapman University in Orange County, California. Uh, I've been at Chapman for about six years. I've worked in technology um, my, my whole life and in higher ed and uh, since about 1997. I've been at two other universities. I was at uh, UC Berkeley and also at the California State University System at one of, at the campus in Sacramento. Um, one thing uh, that I, people don't always gather about me is um, I actually was born and raised in Ireland. I know I don't sound like it. I've been in America for a long time. Uh, but, you know, so I, I feel like I have an interesting um, journey as an immigrant and working as a woman working in technology. Yeah, very, very, very uh, uh, important to share that, I think, because for people that are coming behind you, it's good to know mm -hmm. your path. So can you share your past? How, so from Ireland, how did you get to America? What was your interest in IT? How, how did that mm -hmm. all come to be? Mm -hmm. So um, I grew up, as I mentioned, in Ireland. And, uh, I grew up in the 70s and the early 80s. And um, I often joke with Americans that when Americans graduate from college, if they want to move away from home, they go to another city. Well, in Ireland, I mean, there's more than one city, but I, I was from the big city. And so when I graduated from college, um, I actually moved to Frankfurt in West Germany or in, in Germany. It, it was West Germany at the time. It's Germany now. And I, um, my uh, interesting choice to move to Germany because my German was not very good. So I actually ended up working for the United States Army as a computer programmer. Mm -hmm. um, I met my first husband there. Uh, when he was, he was in the army when he was restationed back in the U.S. Uh, I moved with him and I, I, I think I kind of stumbled into computer programming. Um, my degree is actually in mathematics and uh, I didn't, you, you know, I was the first in my family to go to college. So I thought, you know, the that the path that was open to me was um, to be a teacher. So I kind of assumed I'd be a teacher. Uh, and uh, so I was lucky that I, I stumbled into a field that, that was um, really a great fit for me. So uh, a lot of luck in, in success, I think. And, I, and I've been lucky, I think, a lot through my life. Yeah. So you come to, you work for the U.S. Army, you're a computer mm -hmm. programmer. So now today you are CIO. Mm -hmm. That's not an easy path to get there. So can yeah. you share a little bit more about from being a programmer to who you are today? Yeah, yeah. You know, um, it's it, my title when I was working for the Army was a computer programmer, uh, but it was a, an interesting place to work because it was a small organization. Uh, and so, you know, you kind of got, this was in the 80s, so you kind of got your hands in a lot of different things. I worked on technology people in my age group might remember this, um, Wang technology. And so when I worked to the, you see, I see some recognition. Um, when I moved to the U.S. first, I actually got a job working at Wang Labs and um, worked on the customer service side. But over my career, um, I've been fortunate in being able to do a lot of different types of jobs. I've been a systems administrator and network administrator. And I, I think that that has helped me in preparation um, for becoming a CIO. Uh, I worked mostly when I moved to the U.S. first. I worked mostly on the corporate side, but I moved into higher ed in um, 1997. I wanted to... Um, for personal reasons, I, I wanted to move. We, when we moved to the U.S. first, we lived in St. Louis, Missouri. But for personal reasons, we wanted to move to California. Um, and I was uh, hired at UC Berkeley. In, and, and I know you're at Duke, so this will resonate with you. You know, a lot of the big R1s have highly decentralized IT. I, I was hired as um, uh, uh, 
an IT manager for a local uh, IT organization. One of the things that's great about being in a big organization or a big R1 university is you can move around and um, get lots of different experiences. So I actually was able to make a couple of different moves. I moved from the local IT group, the first one I managed to another one. And then uh, the second group that I was in, it was actually managing IT for the budget and finance um, division, I guess. Uh, and uh, so that was really pretty high profile. Mm -hmm. And I got the opportunity to work on central campus systems, things like PeopleSoft and so forth. And then, and I kind of say, um, I sort of went over to the dark side. I went to work in the central IT group uh, at, as my final stop at Berkeley. Um, so I was at Berkeley for a total of 12 years. Uh, one of the things, and I think my experience is that this happens to women, maybe a little bit more than men. When you're in an organization, uh, especially a, a, like a university where it can be really pretty political, um, when you're in an organization for a long time, sometimes you it's hard, it, it gets to the point where you sort of have some baggage. If you've had to do unpopular things, and I did, because you, you know, you go through budget cuts and, and so forth. Um, I think I got to the point where I knew I couldn't advance because I had too much of that baggage from some of the things that I had done. So I um, took a lateral move to move to the California State University system. Um, CSU Sacramento. And one of the things I say to people um, is I, I think a lot of times people think their careers are going to go like that. And um, I, in my experience, that's not the case. Goes, you go up, you'll go over, you might even take a little dip and, and, um, and it's, it's, it's all good. So for me, taking that lateral move was probably the best thing that could have happened to my career. Um, one of the great things, I know you've been in higher ed uh, for a long time, uh, you move to a new campus, you know a lot of things, right? I, you know, I mentioned that I'd worked on PeopleSoft, I go to a new campus, so you walk in and you're, you're sort of an automatic expert and um, you know all the lingo, but yet diff my experience has been that different universities operate differently. So you, you still have the opportunity to learn. So uh, that's, was great for me when I worked, moved to the Cal State system. And now that I'm at Chapman, which is a private university, again, you come in with a, a great deal of knowledge, but a lot to learn about different things that, that we do. Yeah, very, very interesting. Thank you for that. So um, as a CIO, how many other women, regardless of their ethnicity, have, do you see in that same role across the higher ed? I mean, is that something where women are um, entrenched or is it we're still trying to find our way in? I think we're still trying to find our way in. Um, I, I know when the uh, Educause and other organizations do um, some uh, surveys and so forth. I think we see about 18%, if I'm remembering correctly, of women in the CIO role. And it's, it's, it's even um, much, uh, much less for women uh, it, of color. It, it's much, it's just much, much harder. The, the other is I'm very active locally um, in, in Southern California in a lot of um, IT networking organizations and professional organizations. And I, I I spend a lot of time, well, when we could network in person, you know, I went to a lot of events and it's, I would say it's even worse outside of higher ed. I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I do know that I go to meetings all the time where I'm the only woman in the room, right? Or, or there might be one other woman um, in, in the room. So I, I think we still have a long, long way to go. And I think also that there are still, it, it, it goes to, it comes from very early in our careers. I, you know, you do see, I think, women coming into technology and then kind of um, not, not staying. Mm -hmm. And um, you also see this sort of funnel effect where as you go higher and higher in the organization, you'll see fewer and fewer women and definitely fewer and fewer people of color. So it's kind of like we funnel out as, as we go through the organization. Um, 
so I, I think we have a, a lot that we have to do uh, to, it, there's still a lot that, that we, um, there's still a lot of ground to make up for, for women and uh, particularly I think for um, black women and, and black men, uh, you know, I just don't think that the same opportunities are, have been there for, for people like us. Yeah, I, I agree with you completely. If I were to parallel my career to yours, I should be in charge of the CIO. That's how much mm -hmm. I've done, but I'm still down in the trenches. And yeah. I, that, um, I was on a panel um, earlier in the summer, I think July, I don't remember when it was, but I was on a panel um, for uh, CLAC, you know, uh, Liberal Arts mm -hmm. College. Mm -hmm. And I was really surprised to see how little diversity was there. You know, there were a few black men, you know, a few yeah. women, but it wasn't really as diverse as you would think, especially considering liberal arts has a high right. uptake of people of color and, and, right. and women, whereas STEM has been the exact opposite. You know, we yeah. start off with a STEM career and end up in the humanities or, or something. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. I'm, I'm glad you raised that. I just want to make two points. Uh, first of all, you know, I, I've been passionate about women in technology for, for a long time, but no matter, you know, I know it's hard for women in technology. I, um, I am aware that I bring so much privilege to, to the workplace on a daily basis because of how I look, because of the color of my skin, but also, you know, and I mentioned that I'm an immigrant, also because of how I speak. So I look and I sound, uh, I think the way people expect a CIO to look and sound, right? And that's, I'm, in some ways, I feel like I'm, I've been told I'm kind of the right sort of immigrant because I don't bring an accent and, you know, I look like I've assimilated um, into American life. And the other thing that's interesting is you mentioned that um, women start in the STEM fields and then they, uh, women and people of color start in the STEM fields and, and then, um, you know, we end up in different fields. But actually, I think we're discouraged a lot um, from being, from going into STEM. And I, I will tell you a story about when I grew up and it, I grew up in Ireland, um, and it was the 70s and the 80s. It's a very different place now. I, I, it's, it really is. When I grew up, um, you know, we saw the, the traditional, what we think of as the traditional models, right? My mother stayed home with us, and my dad went to work, and everybody in my community, everybody that I went to school with, that was the same experience. And we have a very different educational experience. Uh, system to the US. And so we do, and I think, I mean, this is what we did when I was a girl, I, it may be different now, but you kind of go through the equivalent of high school. And at the end, you do this exam called the leaving cert and everything counts on that exam, right? If how you get into college, they look at your grades in the exam and they calculate it and then you get accepted or not. And I happen to be very good at math. And I, um, I wanted in, in the leaving cert, you can do higher level or honors or lower level uh, math. And I wanted to do higher level honors math. I, I went to an all-girl Catholic school and they didn't offer that. And so, you know, I talked to the, the nun, the head nun about it, and she just kind of told me, well, you know, girls don't need honors math. Yeah. And, um, you know, and it was like, oh, well, um, so what I actually did is there were a lot of, uh, there were places you could go to get tutoring but the, the intent was really for people who were studying it at school and, and to give them an extra help. But I, I, that's what I did. I did that and I, I studied honors math to go through that. Mm -hmm. Now, another interesting anecdote. So that was like the 70s in Ireland. Um, so I, we have a student at Chapman, a young woman actually, and she is a, a young black woman. Uh, who I've, I've done some work with, and she uh, went to school in Los Angeles in, obviously in the last five years, because she's still, the last few years, she's still a student, and she went to some kind of fancy magnet school, and she was in a technology program. She's actually studying computer science at, at Chapman, and um, she actually had a teacher tell her he was going to assign her some of the more kind of administrative work, not the the networking because and what he told her is you know girls don't like to 
crawl around under desks. And so, you know, it's the same thing that happened to me in Ireland in the 70s, happened to this young, young black woman in Los Angeles yep. in the in, in the 21st century. And it's just, you know, and you just, um, so when you start from there, you're, all, you know, when you're, when you're hearing that in high school, um, it just, it just makes it harder. Yeah, absolutely. And I will tell you, that's not unique for that black woman. That's a lot yeah. of people are still told that, you know, the opportunities for advancement or, you know, even to get to the place where you are. As I was looking at your LinkedIn bio, I was just so impressed. You know, you sit on this Thank board, you. you do this, you do that, you do the other, you know. And so those opportunities to spread out and to grow and to network and to build your, your, your opportunities, right? So, I mean, you said earlier it was luck, but I mean, like, you, as you said, you, you look like the, what we want in America, mm -hmm. right? You know, this you're not going to be overly assertive, not going to be mm -hmm. aggressive, you know, and they're not these labels that they can easily stick on the bottom of you and say, hey, this is who you are. Whereas mm -hmm. a black woman, you know, I think that the injustices that have happened to black and brown people over the years, we are more, I guess, vulnerable to opportunities because we are you know, whatever it is that they believe about black people, whatever yeah. they believe about brown people, mm -hmm. you know, they, they, that we're there. So coming in as a white woman, you have a lot on your plate. But I will mm -hmm. say this, it's not so broad. I mean, because as you said, you go to meetings and you're the only person who looks like you are one mm -hmm. of the only one or two people, right? So that's mm -hmm. my experience too. Yeah. And, and, and I think I may have shared this um, at some other time, but you know, uh, a per, one of the uh, CISOs in in, uh, in higher education came and did a talk at Duke, and she told us this word "he peep." Right, so you can be in a room and mm -hmm. say something, and no one responds to it. Right, the man takes what you said and rephrases it. Yeah, and it becomes a thing. Right, so if you say today is Sunday, it's uh, three o'clock or three thirty, whatever yeah. it is. You know, nobody says anything, but if man comes and says, hey, today might be Sunday, all of a sudden it becomes a thing. It's, right it's gospel. Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so I think that that is true, even for white women, that there's yeah. still a little bit of finding your voice. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I am a proponent of is advocacy. You know, like mm -hmm. people talk about mentors and mentors are great to have. It's great yeah. to have a mentor because a mentor is that person you share, you, you, you express what's happening to you in your job. Mm -hmm. and they kind of give you some advice because they've been there and done that, right? So they're, right. they're great mentors. But advocacy is when you're willing to put some skin in the game, right? Right. You're willing to put your name, your credentials, your cash, mm -hmm. social capital, whatever it is, into the game and have other people respond to what you want. Right. So if you, you, Helen Norris, were to pick up the phone and call somebody and say, hey, I have this person who I think can make a great fit for your company. That's going yeah. to more traction than if I did the same thing, even with more experience and more yeah. opportunities to yeah. get the same thing. So I think that's really a, a, a tough road to hoe for uh, people of color and I, yeah. white, some white women as well. Well, you know, a couple of things I'd like to say about that. The first piece you talked about our voices, right, that were in meetings and, you know, and I've had it happen where a, a, a man has taken credit for my idea and you know sometimes you just kind of go with it but I've I know that there's research that shows as there are more of us in the room if there are and in fact the kind of the tipping point is sort of three if there are three women in the room in the meeting you can amplify each other's voices you know so I do think that one part of advocacy is um, especially for me at this stage of my career and you know it's to be in the room with other women to amplify what they're saying and to make sure that they get credit for it as something that I, I can take on as, as a form of advocacy. Um, the other thing you mentioned is, um, you know, whether it's kind of putting in a call or something for someone, and you mentioned that I serve on a lot of boards, and I feel really, again, I feel um, very fortunate about that. And one of the things that happened for me is a former boss of mine recommended me uh, and he, uh, to be on a board to, he was leaving the board and and he was asked to nominate someone and he nominated me mm -hmm. and I really appreciate that for him so one of the things that we can do as women women like me uh, 
when I have the opportunity to nominate someone or for a position on a board or for an award or something like that, it's important for me. And one of the things I've done for years is to nominate women. And that's not to say I don't nominate men. I do. Uh, but, you know, every time there are plenty of deserving women out there who aren't getting noticed. And that's something that I can do to do that. And I've done that. But one of the things I realize I haven't done and that I really want to work on is to make sure that I especially do the same for um, black women or other women of color or, or men of color, because I have that. The person who nominated me to be on the board was a man. He was a Hispanic man. And I really appreciate him lifting me up like that. And I think it's important for me to, how is it people say, pay it forward to do the same thing for other people who don't look like me. And, um, and that's something that I, I think I can do better at. Absolutely. And so in your organization, um, when you go to hire or you uh, have a vacancy in your organization, mm -hmm. how, how do you deal with that? What are, your, what are your steps that you take to make sure you have a diverse pool, you, you're picking the best person, and you're, you're, you're really getting some buy-in from your leadership about that? You know, so can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. And so there, over the years, I think I've done, um, you, you know, it is hard. I, I think you can only do that with the support of leadership and frankly, with the support of the HR organization, because you've got to know even how to find the right candidates. I know when I look at my organization, um, I, I I've, I've actually had this situation where I've thought, you know, I'm doing great. Our IT organization looks good. I have six direct reports. Four of them are women. I have people of color. And we implemented a new kind of a dashboard in our data warehouse. And I was shocked when I really looked at the numbers and, and saw how much work I had to do, you know, so it's, it's easy to kind of think that you're doing, doing really well, but it, it's, it's hard. Um, I think you have to uh, continue to do networking and reach out to people explicitly to try to bring them into your organization. You can't just put something on LinkedIn or, or uh, on a, a job site and expect to get a diverse pool. Um, so, you know, if you're working with recruiters, you've got to seek the, the right people. But I, I do think it's the networking. Um, the networking, that's how people get jobs, right? It's, it's, it's who you know. And it's, as you pointed out earlier, having somebody make that call for you. Yeah. to say you should look at this person uh, it's it's something i think we can we can all do better with i i recall when i was early in my career i wasn't in higher ed at the time i, I mentioned that when i moved to the u.s first i lived in st louis and, and i worked i was like an it manager i guess um for a, a good sized law firm but it would be a small it organization right and we needed to hire someone so in those days we didn't have the internet you know so we put it in the newspaper the st louis post dispatch and um uh, an organization called me and asked me there was a newspaper in st louis um the st louis american who marketed ex Ex to the African-American community. And they would literally go through the job ads in the post-dispatch, call the recruiting people and say, can we put, run your ad in, in the St. Louis American? And it, to me, that was a real eye-opening moment for me because it, and I was very young, you know, I just didn't, and I hadn't been in the country very long. I didn't know anything, you know, but it was eye-opening for me to understand that you have to explicitly look. And, and in those days, that was the way, um, that was one way that you could look was to, to go to meet people where they are. Right. Don't expect everyone to always um, come to you. Yeah, exactly. And I think that one of the interesting things about what you just said really hits home. is like, you know, someone came to you and asked you, could you put that ad in their paper? But mm -hmm. like, you know, one of the, the key parts of that is like finding historically black schools mm -hmm. colleges and universities where there are candidates that are in these areas. It is looking beyond the typical answer of diversity. So, you know, there's, there are these stereotypes about people, right? So there's this thing, all Asian people are smarter than anyone else. Mm -hmm. They do really well in math. And so you have an organization that has a tremendous number of Asian people. Mm -hmm. You may have one or two Blacks, one or two Hispanics or Latinos, but it's not like it's a diverse pool. So it's right. when you're hiring leadership dogs because every aspect of IT 
specifically, <laughs> all ethnicities are represented. There is no, yeah. you know, if you're starting at the bottom, there's lots of diversity at the bottom. Mm -hmm. It's at the top where the diversity doesn't exist. Yeah. You know, yeah. and so it's really hard to try to make sure that that's the place it is. So, I mean, just like you were talking about the gentleman who nominated you for a board, you know, when you look in your Rolodex and see all those people that you know, how many of those people are you thinking about that opportunity to do that. When you transition yeah. off that board or if there's mm -hmm. a board vacancy, yeah. where's that happen at? And so yeah. I think that it's very important that we think about this in ways that are really inclusive because mm -hmm. you know I, I tell this story often and i have two i'll tell you my first one is is google so in 2015 google released its facial recognition software right all white male team did the development of that mm -hmm. and so whenever this facial recognition software popped up when it saw a person who was not particularly you know of certain skin yeah. tone it would put up a picture of a gorilla and, and, and there's no way in the world yeah. people did that intentionally. That's right. not, you know, it would it's be bad business for them. Mm -hmm. But the problem is when you have homogeneous groups, you're going to get a homogeneous output. You know, yeah. so, you yeah. know, so the old term is garbage in, garbage out, you know, first <laughs> in, first out. You know, there's that piece right there. But, you know, I think in a lot of ways that, you know, this is one of the problems. And then the other part of that for me is like, you know, we assign stereotypes to people, right? So women are considered emotional, emotional. Mm -hmm. we're, we're extremely passive, you know, we have all mm -hmm. these things that, that people stick on us to say this is who we are. Whereas men, if, if you were as in your role to go in and be extremely assertive, not even aggressive, just extreme, you would be labeled by that. Whereas yes, you are. A man who goes yeah. and does that exact yeah. same thing, that's yeah. what expected, right? So, mm -hmm. so it's, it's one of those things where we live yeah. in a world where there's so much mm -hmm. complexity and, and, and labeling of people that, you know, it's hard to understand why we yeah. aren't making any, any progress, but it's also very simple to understand. Yeah. And, you know, I think that's one of the things that we have to do. So a couple of things as individuals, I think it's, it's, important for us to understand, to acknowledge that stereotypes exist and to recognize them. You, you're right on the Google thing. No, they didn't go in and say, let's do, you know, but recognize that you're, if you don't think about it explicitly, you're going to unconsciously in, use your bias in, in decision making or in producing a product, you know, and so, so it's important to keep that in your mind um, at, at all times. It, at the other point you made about, you know, when you look at organizations, you um, I have a point to make again, then I want to ask you a question. Um, you do see diversity in IT at the kind of at the entry level positions, but not as, as I said, you know, it kind of funnels off. So it gets back to that advocacy thing. There is some mentoring involved or sponsorship. It's important for the leaders in the organization to develop that, to, to develop that talent, right? And to bring it, bring it up in the organization because you're hiring great people um, and, and you, give people opportunities in the organizations that they are. But I have a question for you that I related kind of to, to the pandemic. I think one thing in certain areas and a little bit where, where I am, even though it's in California, mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's, it's difficult to get the diversity because you don't live in a diverse area, right? You live in an area where it's predominantly whatever. Um, with the pandemic, we've kind of proven that we can work remotely. So does it open up for us the opportunity to hire people from a more geographically, um, from different geographies? And can that help us to diversify the workforce? You know, that's a very interesting question. I think the fact that we have shown that we can work remotely, like many companies are going to remote work only, you know, or going to some, some form of it. I know a lot of the companies in Silicon Valley have talked about yeah, that yeah. Said for a year or two, you know, they've said that people don't have to come into the office. Right. I think that's a change of mindset, right? Because mm -hmm. one of the problems that working remotely introduced is measuring the productivity of your people when you mm -hmm. don't, when you're not right there with you. And I think when you, when you, you kind of juxtapose that to in-person uh, work, so the person has basically an hour for lunch, two 15 minute mm -hmm. breaks, you know, and because of the social nature of being in person, we're mm -hmm. so, so measuring productivity remotely has to be 
put, I guess, measure productivity in place. Right. So when, you, when you measure those two things, it's kind of hard to say that the person is more productive in, in the office than they are at home. Right. Because at mm-hmm. home, you feel more, you feel driven to do more because, mm-hmm. you know, you just feel like, you know, I'm at home. I'm, you know, I can mm-hmm. get in my pajamas. I don't have to, you know, whatever it is. So there's that. And I think specifically for Black people, where that rubber hits the road is, is that we aren't given the benefit of the doubt in the office. So when we go yeah. home, you know, you're kind of you really don't get it. Right. Because, you know, you're assuming that we're lazy. We're going to be late. We're going to do whatever it is that we're going to do. And, and there's these, again, it goes back to those stereotypes. Yeah. Right? I think that it is possible for it to be a better thing, but we really have to change our mindsets. Yeah. And it really, you know, if you think about slavery, and I don't know how f- familiar you are with American history, but, you know, first, the people come to America from Europe, and they colonize indigenous people, right? Mm-hmm. And they eventually slaughter as many of them as they could. Then they go to Africa and they bring over mm-hmm. another group yeah. of people and they colonize them as well. Mm-hmm. You know, so when you think about things like that, you know, it's kind of one of those things that you have to get buy-in from white people to be willing to make this change. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, we didn't end, black people didn't not end slavery. You know, we didn't, mm-hmm. we didn't just broke up, walk out one day and say, we're done right. with this. You know, it took white people being in the, in the fight with yeah. us to get us there. This is another one of those examples where yeah. it takes white people being in the fight with us. You yeah. know, you've got to, you know, if you, if in your organization, you look across your IT staff and you've got Asians, you've got Hispanics and you've got black people and whatever else that you've got, do you sit down and assess how valuable they are to the organization mm-hmm. and what they bring? And I think, you know, I, I've said this in several of my chats, you know, like when you're getting ready to hire someone, Typically, especially for a, a senior role or a leadership role, typically what you do is you bring the people in that are just like that, right? People who are right. already CIOs yeah. or CEOs yeah. or whatever, senior directors or whatever it is. And mm-hmm. the problem with that is it's, it's group think. It's the same. Yeah. So everybody in that space has mm-hmm. the exact same experiences. Where if you take that person that you just hired, he is first yeah. day in your organization, he's desktop support or field mm-hmm. support or whatever you want to call him, and you bring him into the meeting, he has things to tell you that you've yeah. long forgotten, right? You know, mm-hmm. what it was like when you first started in IT, yeah. what the struggles that you have, some of the issues that you experience. If you bring people from other parts of the organization into your, your interviewing mm-hmm. or, or hiring process, you get a diverse pool of people. Right. If you're only bringing in CIOs, you're going to hire someone yeah. that's just like yeah. you, or CTOs or CISOs, whatever they are, they're going to look, and that's what you see. Yeah. And I think that working from home introduces a whole bunch of other pieces to that that mm-hmm. are not necessarily accurate, but they allow us to feel comfortable that we did our due diligence, right? So if you, right. If you were hiring a CTO and you, you hire a search agency to fire, hi, find you a CTO, that search agency is probably going to be predominantly white and male mm-hmm. or white somehow or another. It's not the, the candidates they're going to do, they're going to start excluding people immediately mm-hmm that don't fit this model, right? So if you, you create a job description that says you want this, this, and this, and this, and you want somebody who's had 10 years experience in this, people have done all these things, they then start looking for that person. Right. And that person almost inevitably is a white, white. person, most likely a white yeah. male. So yeah. I hope my question wasn't too long, answer wasn't too long. But no, it's, it's, it's I, and I just want to kind of, re, you know, it's not even just at the leadership levels. It's in these highly technical jobs, right? That we go out and we say, we want you to have five years experience with Oracle or, or whatever. That naturally excludes people. And it's not even necessary. And right. so, you know, what, what I've observed through my years in IT is often the route to the CIO is through some of these really highly visible, highly technical parts of the organization. So women in particular are often on the customer service side and and you won't necessarily see um, people move from from that part of the organization up to the CIO level, which is one of the reasons it was important for me to do some lateral moves to kind of fill in some of those gaps. So, you know, it's, it's, I think it's even important to change our thinking on roles that aren't at the leadership level, but that are highly visible technical roles in in IT. And and I want to also comment on one other thing you said, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, you know, I think I probably saw this on a meme or something on social media. 
white people, we need to see the race issue as a problem for white people. As long as we look at it and go, well, we want to help black people, you know, we want to make it better for black people. It's our problem too. The Google example is a great example. You know, the, the exclusion didn't just impact the people who were excluded, right. although it impacted them the most, but it impacted the team that was working because they did a, a they produced a less, um, a less, a, 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 an inferior product. And so, you know, so it, I think that's the thing, you know, and it's, it's, it's something that we hear a lot these days. We have to, as white people, own the race issue as, as our issue. Right. And, and, and that's very important that you say there, because I think that the problem with where we are in our society as a whole, you know, so we've got all this, you know, law enforcement violence mm -hmm. portrayed on, on black people, you know, you know, the first question you ask is, do you see me as human? You know, yeah. so. I have two children. I have a black son, a black daughter, and a black husband. All of us. Mm -hmm. And every time they leave me, my fear is going yeah. to return to me. Yeah. So I think that law enforcement, to some degree, has this stereotype that's so embedded into what mm -hmm. we are. So we're drug users. And I'll give you an example. So if you take the crack epidemic, I don't know if you really were mm -hmm. in the crack epidemic. Yeah, I was here. America, mm -hmm. Then you take the 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 oxycodone, these, these opioids right. and, and methamphetamines, these are described when white people are in these epidemics as mental health issues. Right. But crack was a it's criminal a, issue. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so when police apply the logic that someone has come mm -hmm. up with and said, this is who we are, then you're going to have the outcomes that we have. Yeah. And the point is so valid that we need white people to join us in the trenches, you know, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, my relationship with you fairly new we haven't known each other for a long time but you know i want to be a part of what you're doing because i find mm -hmm. it so impressive when i like i said when i looked at your linkedin profile and i think even uh chapman has a a biology a biography of you there it's just i mean it's impressive as all get out i know a lot of cios i know a lot of people who have done some great things but none of them compared to what you are doing and what you have done. It's, it's very impressive, you know? And so I think that you have the power to bring change. And I hope that you and people that think like you and have the same opportunities you, are, you have, that you think about how can I make my organization different? How do I make this world yeah. a better place? Because it's one thing to go to work and do your job, right? So you're the CIO, you make sure the organization has supplies its need to its customers and all mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But do you make an impact on the world? Yeah. Do you yeah. change society? And with yeah. us in these roles, emerging technologies are coming fast and furious. Right. You know, so think about who's going to be hit by that. I'll yeah. give you another example. So I love Sam's Club. I go to Sam's Club. Oh, okay. Um, about a year ago, they introduced an app. You put on your phone Sam's Club, right? Mm -hmm. And you go in, you open your phone. They say, yes, you're right. Member, and you scan. And when you mm -hmm. scan every item you you bought you could just walk out the door because yeah yeah you know so who's going to be displaced because i don't know what it's like in right california you are in but you know yeah all these things that are coming yeah about, yeah you have to be purposeful and intentional about what we're doing and you know mm -hmm. if we are not then we are really doing a disservice to all because i think that black and brown people bring a unique perspective to all of technology all of stem a very unique right so yes there all of these things so I just think that people like you really hold the chance for there to be better. Well, that's what I really want to do. And that's one of the reasons that I, I'm so happy to be connected with you. Because I do feel like for the last, you know, several years, I have focused so much on the issues of women and gender issues in technology to the exclusion of of other issues and it's hard in some way it's, it's it is hard it's i i had it's i have to put myself out there right to talk about race and um and so that's why i so appreciate <laughs> that you're having this conversation with me and and um willing to to listen to to what i have to say and to share your knowledge with me but that's i think the thing that that I really want to challenge myself to do better. Um, as I, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm in my late fifties, you know, I, I don't have, I don't know how much time I have left, but that's where I want to focus. Um, 
you have a lot of time left. I have a lot of time left. I hope so. I, for a while. <laughs> I, I hope so. But it is, I, I, I feel for you, I, I'm obviously, but my children, I think I've mentioned this to you before, are African American. So I have a, a slight sense of, of what you feel. And, um, you know, I think as white people, though, we can't, it's so much harder for us to internalize it or to, to understand. And what you said about it's the, the interactions with, with uh, the police force, you know, that the, there's so much implicit bias built in. Um, and it's not just the police, because we've seen a, a rash, right, of things happen over the last couple of years with women who look like me calling the police because, you know, a black person's having a barbecue. And how do we kind of turn ourselves around? Oh, I'm sure they're all really nice women who really just have this in, in un, un, implicit kind of bias that they didn't even realize they had. And so how do we kind of work on that? I think the first part is to kind of say, I need to work on it, you know, and I need to work on it. So, so thank you for being there for me. Well, absolutely. And I, and as I said to you before, is if you need anything from me, I am right there. You don't even have to you know, just, just call or text or <laughs> email or something. I'm right there. I think the thing that's really interesting about you, you know, like, so the younger people use a word called woke, like you're awake <laughs> or a woke. Um, I, I still haven't mastered what that means. Yeah. Um, but I think that maybe it translates to intentional, you know, being, mm -hmm. paying attention, you know, to be intentional in your actions and your thoughts and your, the way you, where you go, you know, it, it is necessary for you. It is necessary for mm -hmm. Helen Norris to be in the fight with everybody else. You know, mm -hmm. it's necessary for Helen Norris when you're, when you're thinking when a job opening comes up or a board opening comes up or something comes up, you don't automatically think about the people that you're most comfortable with, right? Right. So this, this word I learned when I was getting my doctorate degree, which, you know, as old as I am, you think I would have known this, but it has a translation. It's a homo social reproduction. We prefer to be with those people who look like us, right? right. That in the old days was called the old boys club, right? Yeah. So that kind of thing. But, you know, the problem with preferring to be with the people like us is we don't grow as a society. We don't right. grow and mature as human beings, mm -hmm. right? Because if I'm only with black people, my experience is only going to be what their experiences are, yeah. the, the lens they see the world through. Whereas I don't want to be stuck in a space that right. that's all I know. I, I, I lived in Miami during the Muriel boat with, um, when, when the Cubans came in and, you know, mm -hmm. there was a lot of talk and there was a lot of racism associated with that because, you know, they were told that these were the people who uh, Castro let out of his jail, these were criminals. And, oh uh, my God, yeah. So, so all of that kind of stuff. And the problem with that though is that when we make these assumptions with people by some mm -hmm. physical characteristic that means absolutely nothing, that you have blue eyes and blonde hair, that you're six foot tall or that you're thin mm -hmm. or whatever it is, these are physical characteristics that change over time, yeah. right? You know, yeah. so, and if you look at any person when they die, they turn darker. So why yeah. in the world would we care about physical characteristics of a mm -hmm. person? Is the person a decent person? Is the person willing to help? Is the person mm -hmm. contributing to the society as a whole? You know, and I've been asked a lot about these diversity chats, right? So when Mr. Fuller was killed in May, it hit me so hard to see that. And I mm -hmm. think, again, going back to technology, technology makes these things visible, I know. Now, right? Because they were happening a long time ago. Yes, they we were. Them, we can watch them on TV. We can see them on the yeah. news. It's in our social media feeds, you know, mm -hmm. these things are happening. What are we doing? What yeah. are we as a society doing to think about just the race, opportunity, education, all of these places, right? I had a chat um, yesterday with a young man. Um, he is in Pakistan. He was going to a predominantly white school here in America. And when the virus hit, he went home, you know, to see about right. his family and to help his family. And uh, the story he told was, you know, so some of the immigration policies that are, are, are driven by uh, politics, mm -hmm. you know, 
how he's seen, you know, all of these things. And, you know, being in Pakistan, we just had 9-11, the, the, uh, yeah. the 9-11 yeah. a couple of days ago. So, you know, all of these things kind of mm -hmm. fluctuate. And so this young man is brilliant. I mean, he's got great skills and, he, you know, he, he will be a great contributor to America's yeah. all go. And he wants to work in America. He wants to have help his mm -hmm. family and his community in Pakistan which to me is an example of a true human being. You know, right. I know I can contribute something to this society, but I also want to help my family, which is what we all want, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. you know, contribute to society. I shouldn't say we all, because there's probably some people who Most don't. people do. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. You know, so I think that there's just too much in the environment about race and gender. And, you know, I, I applaud you for, you know, doing what you're doing for women. But I ask that, you know, you think about the entire spectrum of yeah. what a society is like, right? So I asked this question um, at a panel I was doing uh, a while ago. Um, Mae Jemison came to my university and, and wow. did a talk. And so yeah. I asked, how many Native Americans or indigenous people does this university have? You know, how many Native Americans or indigenous people are CIOs who are faculty? Yeah. Where, where is that? And, you know, it was almost like crickets. No one said a word yeah. to my question. I still don't know the answer to that question. So if we think just simply about that. So when you talk about true Americans, if there's such a thing, that's the true Americans. Yeah. They were here long yeah. before all the rest yeah. of us came. But then you come to here where we are now, we don't even consider them. We don't even think about yeah. them. We don't make a, a, a concerted effort to hire them and bring them into our mm -hmm. organization. So we consider the Indians from India or, you know, Asia, mm -hmm. that's our new substitute for diversity. And you look at right. most colleges, there's a huge Asian population, mm -hmm. of faculty, all of those things, but no other group. And that's, that's something I think that we should change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, I agree. And we, we have to do it all. We all have to do it together. And um, it, it's true. It has been a very hard time, uh, you know, with the, there's the pandemic and then, and it, it doesn't feel like uh, when you, you watch the murder of George Floyd, which we get to see and it's just, um, and then you see another and another, it's, it's, yeah, if, if I'm not always hopeful, it makes me sometimes feel, even for me, um, just like, how, how can this be? And it makes me worry for the next generation, the next generation of black boys who are going to, um, who could experience this. Okay. It's, um, I, I would even say for your daughters, I mean, mm -hmm. like you have, whether you want it or not, an obligation to pave yeah. a path for them. Mm -hmm. Because though you identify as white, Society is not going to identify them as white. I don't care. You're right about that. Care <laughs> what kind of hair they have. Yeah. Society is not, you know, going. No, to, it's true. Going, so, your role as a parent <laughs> should translate into making sure opportunities are available for people for them. of color, specifically yeah. based on the fact that you have two daughters. Yeah. Society is going to paint their own mm -hmm. lens, right? So yeah. they see them in this way which may not even be true, may not even right. be factual, you know, but just automatically assumed. And so I, I don't know if you've seen the movie, The Blind Side, but it's about this. Football. Yes. Yeah. 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 So really mm -hmm. About that. When you think about that perspective, you know, it takes a white person to save a black person. You know, it takes a white person to, to, to make opportunities available. And I think there's a little bit of truth to that. But I think the problem is, is that we already assume that this is not possible in our society for black people to get up. And, you know, I heard this story, so pull yourself up by your bootstrap. What happens if you don't have boots? Yeah. You know, what happens if you don't have the, the mm -hmm. strings to pull yourself up? Mm -hmm. You know, there are these assumptions. And so for black women, your daughters, my daughters, me, and all the black women that you know, we're depending upon you to think about this and to engage mm -hmm. people in uncomfortable conversations. And they yeah. really need to be very uncomfortable. Because yeah. If they're not uncomfortable, you're just going to be able to walk yeah. away from that and say, oh, well, you know. Yeah. No, I, uh, no, that, that makes sense to me. That, yeah. that makes sense to me. And it is, it is, it, it makes, that's the thing is we, white people, 
we have to be willing to be uncomfortable because okay. we, we it's we have we're pretty comfortable and so you know that's the the um the that's what what we have to do so. and, and and i would just add this one thing you said earlier about privilege you have privilege mm -hmm. and, um you are visible in your it community probably in the overall it community throughout the I, world yeah you know, you're, you're, you're visible so when your children come, if, if they decide they want to be in IT or they want to be a doctor or they want to do something mm -hmm. in engineering or whatever it is, will they get that same opportunity and have the same luck that you had to get where you are? If you do not put things in place to make that happen. For yeah. Them, you yeah. Know? yeah. Yeah. It's, it's true. And it's interesting, you know, the word privilege, a lot of people, it, 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 it are kind of offended or insulted to right. think that they have privilege. Um, it doesn't mean you would, I, I mean, I worked hard. It didn't mean right. I right. didn't work hard, right. but I have privilege. Right. I, you know, it's, it, it's, it's just, it's, it doesn't make me a bad person. Not at all. I just need to understand that for a person like you who didn't come into the world with the, the same um, level of privilege that I did, it's so much harder. And um, what, can I do to change that and to to make to make that better? Absolutely. And how and can I use my privilege? Right. You know, my you know, one of my daughters sent me a video one time of um, it was after a police shooting, and the young man, the victim's brother, was went to the city council meeting or something, and she literally he was really upset naturally his brother had just been killed by the police and she literally the a white woman literally put her body between this young man and the police and that's i you know to me that was a an example of how to use your privilege right and you know that's a pretty gutsy way and you know that's the kind of thing that we have to do as white people is put our bodies put our beings in the way of, of danger um so i think that's absolutely correct I, we're running out of time i want to ask okay. you a question first i want to ask you have you gone back to ireland since you left as a little yeah girl? yeah yeah i go uh, my my entire family most of my family is there so uh, we go every couple of years or every lately i've gone more often because my father has been sick and it has changed so much you know um when as i said when i was young it was very um the, the the role of women was you know we were really in a different place you know we were not treated equally and I, I see change I see change at, at lots of different levels um, some of that is because it is a little island and when I grew up you know I'm, we weren't like off completely isolated or something but people didn't travel the way that they do now. I, I didn't get on a plane until I was like 15, you know. And um, so I think that that has helped us bring in some outside influences. We also, when I was a girl, we had a really difficult economy. And so we didn't have immigration, we had emigration. We used to kind of joke that our biggest export was our children. You know, we'd send our children, all, you know, everybody in America claims to be Irish, right? right. Um, and in the 80s and early 90s, we began to have immigration because our um, economy improved and the Soviet Union collapsed. And so you first you started to see a lot of Eastern European immigrants and then immigrants from African nations. And so it is a more diverse. When I was a girl, everybody looked like me. You know, it was really homogenous. And now we see um, more diversity uh, because we have immigration and um, it's changing the country. We have a booming, uh, well, we did have, it's not booming like it was, but we went through an economic boom um, as we went through this. We also, I, I think the role of the Catholic church um, has really changed. When I was a girl, the Catholic church was really powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not true anymore. I mean, people in Ireland, I think still identify as Catholic and they go to mass. But actually, I would say, um, you know, the Catholic Church uh, reinforced a lot of those gender stereotypes. I mean, they literally told, you you know, because of the, the influence, you know, women couldn't, they, we couldn't 
had contraception it was actually illegal you know let alone divorce you know and so in the last couple of years we have actually had a referendum and voted gay marriage so we have our in fact our last prime minister was a gay man Mm -hmm. and so to me that would never have happened i'm shocked to see that it turned around in a single generation but i I think the church had a lot of influence that it's recently lost yeah i I went to catholic school early on and i remember the rigidity of of the catholic religion you know and i think that you know a lot of what we know know about the world people use religion to con- condemn yeah. penalize destroy whatever it is that suits their agenda regardless and i think that's very unfortunate for us mm-hmm. that is indeed the case that we are you know i i am not i, I don't i don't uh subscribe to any religion i was i believe in god i believe mm-hmm. in the universe and that's 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 as far as i can get i can't get any yeah. further than that because the fact that you can use religion to, you know, like, so black people, for example, there's a, a, a quote that the Klan and white supremacists use is about the story of Ham. So Ham supposedly went into a tent and had relations with his daughter. And so from, from that, he put, God put a stamp on people and anybody that comes out black is because of Ham's oh transgression, wow. you know? So that's Christian religion, right? So, yeah. and there's so many pieces and parts of that you have Catholic, you know, with the, ch- you know, children being molested by yes, and all that, yes, stuff. that all yeah. these different things that happen, you know, that people wrap themselves up in religion and become so absorbed in it, they don't, you can't see, your lenses are right. clouded, right? You can't see what's really happening. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad that Ireland has made that choice. And, you know, it's always been one of those places I've wanted to go. You know, I, I've been to Germany a couple of times, ah, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, I, um, my daughter went to Finland, um, wow. younger, you know, um, and you know, I traveled a lot when I was younger, but I've always wanted to go to Ireland, but I've always been afraid because like, I think what would a black person do in a whole white country? <laughs> so what, what would happen to me? You know, would I make it out, you know? And so, oh yeah, it's, yeah. I, I think, um, well now it's, it's, it's way more diverse. I brought my children there when they were little and they were, and they were, and it, it was, it was fine but you know they were you didn't see many other kids who looked like them at the time so it's um it's changed quite a bit since then well thank you so much for chatting thank you we have a a couple of minutes left so if you have anything you want to add please uh please and uh, as soon as the video converts i'll send you a link and you can review it let me know if i may upload it that sounds great um you know we've covered so much i don't know that i i really have anything to add other than you know i I, one of the things as i said i want to kind of rededicate myself in in some ways to um, making it particularly in higher ed a more welcoming place for people of color as i've done for women for many years so i know you have quite a following and um i i just want to encourage people to reach out to me the way i'm sure people reach out to you at the way you reached out to me um and because i'd love to have a conversation and and uh and i'd love to get advice and um I, I, I don't know. I'll just say my email address is hnorris at chapman.edu. And I encourage, I'd love to hear from any of your, your um, connections. So thank you again, Rochelle. I've really enjoyed this. Thank you very much. Stay well. And you have my contact information. I do. And please reach out. And I'm sorry. I normally don't use my phone over the weekend. So I turn oh. it off and put it somewhere. So yeah. I'm, <laughs> but I'm happy you were able to do this today. So have a great rest of your day. But let me ask you one question before we mm-hmm. go. Are you not susceptible or vulnerable to the fires that are in California? So- oh, well, we're um, a little bit away from the fires. We So actually, I'm looking out the window now, and it looks pretty nice. But the last few days, it's just been really smoky. Mm-hmm. And so actually, I was telling my husband, I felt it in my throat and my nose, you know, so to me, so I'm, again, very fortunate that I'm not somewhere where my home is in danger. Even my, one of my daughters lives in the Bay Area and same kind, much smokier up there. So um, that's the worst that, that we felt. So then hopefully it stays that way, but man, it was smoky and it made, you could, I was like, I don't, do I have the coronavirus or is it just the smoke, you know? <laughs> so hopefully it was just the smoke. Wonderful work. Thank you so much again for chatting, and I'm glad you're safe and your children are safe. Thank you. Well, thank you, and stay in touch, please. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye.